Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we now start the second session of this uh, conference, and uh, I am extremely pleased to uh, introduce you to uh, Professor Jacques Charme, who uh, will be moderating this, uh, this session. And uh, uh, the name of this session is Understanding Informality. And just uh, as a little, uh, I, I allow myself to make a little bit of uh, advertisement to Professor Charm because <laughs> he just recently published a, a book which is called The Dimension of Resilience in Developing Countries, uh, titled Informality, Solidarities, and Care Work. And the Professor Charm has been like uh, extensively researching uh, uh, at the IRD, the French uh, Research Institute uh, for, uh, for Research Studies, and uh, he is, it is an honor to have him today moderating this session. So, Professor? So thank you very much for these uh, nice words. So I am going to moderate uh, this session uh, on uh, uh, um, the understanding of the work in the informal economy, work relations and conditions across the globe. Uh, there is a little change uh, uh, compared uh, with the program that uh, has been distributed because due to uh, uh, a missing, uh, a missed uh, connecting flight, one of the speakers uh, will arrive uh, later on. It is uh, Alexandre uh, Kolev, who will present uh, his paper uh, at the next session. So uh, he will be replaced by one of the speakers of the last session. So we have uh, three speakers for this uh, uh, session. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, Shanti uh, Nataraj, uh, who is the director of the Labor and Workforce Development Program at the RAND Corporation. And she will explore the diversity that the research can explain about informal work relations uh, with a special uh, focus on uh, the informal employer, uh, employee relations in Bangladesh. Uh, the second speaker uh, is uh, Francesca, Francisca Pereira, who is a professor at the Department uh, of Economics at uh, the University Nas National University General Sarmiento in, uh, in uh, Argentina. And uh, we, we will address the how policy and informality interact for domestic workers in Argentina. And finally, the third presenter is uh, Benjamin uh, Lambore, uh, who is a social research project and data manager from the organization Encore Research, uh, who is based in uh, Cambodia, and uh, who will present uh, uh, decent work interventions for uh, the garment sector in Cambodia. So each uh, speaker uh, will have uh, 20 minutes uh, for uh, its presentation. And uh, uh, you can keep your questions for the end because as uh, in the first session, the questions and answers are uh, for the end uh, uh, of the session. So uh, I will uh, call first uh, Shanti uh, Nataraj for her presentation. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to talk, as, as Jacques mentioned, a little bit about some of the work that I have done with some colleagues of mine at RAND and also at the Bangladesh Institute for Development Studies and Brack University, um, looking at informal informality as a whole in Bangladesh and also at the relations between informal employers and their employees. Um, and this, this body of work was really inspired by something that I think we've talked about, heard about a lot during the first session this morning, which is really this idea that while a lot of parts of the developing world have experienced a lot of growth, economic growth overall over the past 20, 30, 40 years, we've really seen a very stubborn lack of movement in the share of people who are employed informally throughout the developing world. And that's very much in contrast to what we think of as the cross-sectional relationship between formality and economic income, right? Which is that as a country gets richer, we would typically expect to see less informality. But on a country-by-country -country basis in many places, that just doesn't seem to be happening, at least over the last couple of decades. 
So if we take the case of Bangladesh, for example, um, if you look at the decade, say, from 2002 to 2013, and these dates were picked because this is when their labor force surveys were done, you'll see that GDP per capita actually grew substantially during this time. It didn't quite double, but in real terms, it grew very rapidly, um, in part fueled by the amazing growth of their textile exporting sector. But then if you look at the data from the labor force surveys of these years, what you'll see in the blue bars is that the share of formal employment has really been low. It's been 15% from between 2002 to 2010. It didn't budge at all. And then in 2013, it ticked up a little bit, just by a few percentage points. But in general, it's come nowhere close to keeping up with the kind of overall GDP per capita growth that we've seen. And so to us, this inspired a couple of questions. Mainly, you know, if, if we're stuck with a large share of informality for a long period of time, then first of all, to what extent are individual people within Bangladesh stuck with that informality? Or is there churn, is there movement between formal versus informal jobs? And second of all, if we are stuck with informality, or at least a large share of informality for a long time, then what could the government do in order to improve the quality of jobs in the informal sector? And I'll touch a little bit on um, some of the research we've done along these lines. We have a couple of working papers um, that are IZA working papers, and I'm happy to share afterwards or talk about more details. So, and again, this is, this is something that I think came up in the first session a lot. One of the key things that we found in Bangladesh is informality is, is not a one zero concept. It's not that there are jobs that are pure formal and jobs that are purely informal. It's really a very messy continuum. So at, say, the very left end of this graph, you might see a job that doesn't even have safe working conditions. It has no contract whatsoever. It's typically casual day labor. Or for example, it might be an unpaid family worker working in a, a home-based business, for example. Um, then you might get to some of the more what we think of as basic formal job benefits like a minimum wage or paid sick leave. And then working your way all the way towards the right-hand side of the graph, you really get to the most formal jobs, jobs with a pension, which typically in Bangladesh tend to be government jobs. And for the most part, government jobs only. So just to also clarify a point here, the informal sector in Bangladesh is also very, very heterogeneous. Um, about 60% of the workers there, and as of 2013, were employed as self-employed workers or unpaid family workers contributing to their family businesses. So a very large share would simply fall outside of the traditional employer-employee contract. Um, an additional 20% are employed as what we would think of as casual workers. Um, in other words, they tend to be day laborers or domestic workers or seasonal workers who simply migrate from a rural area to the city in order to do some work and then go back home. Only about 20% of the workers were employed in what is defined as a regular employer-employee relationship um, which I must say that I think many of the people in this room would even consider most of those jobs not formal, simply because either they aren't legally entitled to the protections that we think of as being entitled to in jobs in Europe and the US, or those protections simply are not enforced. So we conducted two separate surveys, and I'll highlight a couple of the results from both of them that I think speak to these, these two questions about informality in, in Bangladesh. The first question, as I mentioned, is asking whether individual workers are locked into informality or whether individual workers actually tend to transition between jobs with different types of benefits. That is, is informality an absorbing state that you cannot leave or is informality a state that you might transition into and out of? So to get at this issue, we interviewed about 2,000 workers in the major urban and peri-urban areas of Dhaka and Chittagong. Those are the two big cities in the country. Um, and we asked them about their work history. So we asked for a detailed work history for the last 15 years. And importantly, we didn't just ask them what kinds of jobs they had. We asked them what kinds of benefits they had and what kinds of working conditions they had in current jobs and in jobs over the past 15 years so that we could actually look at people's retroact look retroactively at people's transitions from one type of work to another. Um, this is the key result that I want to present from this, from this finding. I hope everyone can still hear me, but I want to point a little bit to the screen, so I'm going to move over. So what, we, what we're showing here is a 
shows people's previous jobs and then people's current jobs. So I'm just showing you one job to the next in this. You could, of course, do that several more jobs. So we ended up classifying employees into five different groups. Government employees, what we call private employees in essentially regular employer-employee relationships, casual employees, so this is day laborers, domestic workers, and seasonal workers, the self-employed, and then family members who are contributing to a family business. So what this <coughs> chart is telling you is, let's take the private employee row, for example. Of the people who said that the last job they did was as a private sector regular employee, only 57% said that their current job, the one they moved into, they were still in a regular private sector job. So essentially, that's the part where they haven't changed their work. But then if you look at this red highlighted box, nearly 40% of these people had moved out of private sector employment into less state, what we might think of as less formal work, right? So either 7% of them had gone <coughs> to casual employment and 32% had gone into self-employment. On the other hand, of course, 4% of them had gone to become government employees. So this was actually quite surprising to us. It was more churn than we had expected to see um, during one job transition. I'll also highlight the other red box on here, which is that if you look at people who used to be casual employees or who used to be self-employed or family members, um, 20 to 30% of those people had moved from a job, from this type of job, to a job where they were a private employee in a regular job. Again, not necessarily a very formal job the way we might think about it, but still moved from an, a relationship that didn't have an employer-employee contract to one that did. So we concluded from this that there is actually a fairly substantial amount of churn going on between workers moving from jobs in the informal sector to jobs in the formal sector. And I think the key takeaway in terms of policy is that when we think about policies to support informal workers, we can't think of individual workers as being purely formal or purely informal, we have to instead think about workers who may spend part of their lives, say, doing gig work, part of their lives doing a regular job. In fact, they may overlap in some of these jobs and doing them at the same time. Might even spend some time, you know, contributing to a family member's small business and then go and start one of their own. So the other thing um, that we tried to get at was, as I said, you know, if, if you think about a, gov a government like Bangladesh. We talked this morning about how really extending full social protections, UBI or some other type of system, is going to cost a substantial share of government GDP, especially in a country like Bangladesh. So what motivated our second question was, look, if you can't necessarily realistically provide all the benefits you would like to to the informal sector, what benefits would be most valued by employees in that sector? And what benefits are the easiest to convince informal employers to provide, whether through enforcement or whether through providing them with incentives? So we wanted to identify that question. And one of the challenges with doing so is that typically we estimate willingness to pay for specific job benefits by watching people's transitions between jobs with different types of benefits. You can't do that in this context because there simply aren't rich data that track workers over time. So what we did instead was we used um, a choice experiment, which is a stated preference method that helps you elicit people's willingness to pay by observing the hypothetical trade-offs that they make. So let me show you um, one of the choice experiments that we, that we ran. What we would do is essentially, we did, we did a separate survey in this case. We interviewed about 850 um, owners of informal enterprises. These are typically small. The sort of average number of employees was about four. And then we interviewed their employees as well. And we asked both of them about their preferences. So for employees, we would offer, for example, a choice. Let's say between two jobs. Um, we would, the jobs would differ across a variety of different benefits. In this case, the no amount of days of notice the employer has to give, the number of days of notice the employee has to give, whether or not the employee gets paid leave and how much, how many hours are worked by the employees and whether or not they get overtime pay, um, whether or not the employees are covered by accident insurance if they get hurt on the job, and then finally, their monthly income. And here's an example um, of how this choice experiment worked. If you look at job A and job B, job B, the, both the jobs are the same along four of the different benefits. So you might prefer job A because you get more notice from your employer if they're going to let you go. On the other hand, you might prefer job B because it pays a higher income than job A. And so how the choice experiment works is that 
We had 48 different sets of choices. We offered six different sets to each of the workers in our experiment. Um, and the, the choice experiment was optimized to essentially change the different options offered so that we can estimate the willingness to pay for each of the benefits by looking at how much income each employee was willing to give up in order to get the different types of benefits. For the employers, we offered a slightly different experiment. What we did in this case was we still had the same different five types of benefits that they might offer their employees. But in this case, of course, employers would typically by default not be interested in giving most of these benefits. So we offered two different options. We had what we called a carrot version, in other words, a system. And so we would say to the employer, look, you can offer your workers 60 days of notice instead of 15, which you might not prefer. But if you do that, then you would have access to a low interest loan, which in this context is approximately a 9% interest loan, which is very good, you know, these sort of tiers. So they might decide to choose to give more um, notice to employees just in order to get access to a loan or to marketing assistance. Those are the two carrots that we offered. Similarly, we looked at what we called the stick option. In other words, we said, okay, maybe we don't offer incentives, but we say, look, if you don't offer the you know, this, this higher number of days of notice to your employees, you'll receive a 5,000 taka fine. And that's a fairly substantive fine if you think about that in terms of the profit of a small business um, in this context. And so again, we varied the different levels of benefits and we varied the fines and we varied the incentives so that we could basically tell how much employers were willing to give to their employees and what incentives or what fines it would take to really enforce those benefits. I'm going to highlight a couple of the results um, without worrying too much about all the specific numbers on this page. One key thing that we took away from this is that both employers and employees highly value notice from both parties. In other words, we had expected employers to say, well, we want to get notice but not to give notice, and employees to say the same. We actually found something a little bit different. We found that job stability seems to be valued by both parties as long as they can guarantee that there is reciprocity from both sides and that that's enforced. Um, we actually were surprised by these results and did some focus groups where we asked employers and employees about their preferences over um, getting notice from both parties. And they basically said, look, it's really important for us as an employer to know if our employee is going to quit in two weeks. And it's important for me as an employee to ha know that I you know, have a couple of weeks to line up a job for myself so I can continue to feed my family. Um, and so we found that this really seems to be a win-win situation. Um, and I'll talk about it a little bit in a couple of slides, but it seems like maybe there's a coordination issue going on where we're, we're seeing a lot of situations where people aren't giving and getting notice, um, but it seems like most people really value that. Um, and so it seems like there may be an informational problem or a coordination problem going on in the background. Um, in fact, just putting monetary values on this, employers would be willing to accept really quite a high 12,600 taka fine in order to get 30 days notice from their employees. So that's suggesting quite a high valuation that they're placing on having the stability in their workforce. Um, I apologize, that isn't showing up very well, but I'll just tell you what the basic takeaway is. It's that employees are willing to give up about 10 to 12 percent of their monthly income in order to get accident insurance. In other words, if they get hurt on the job, to have the employer pay for their medical costs. Um, this is a fairly, it's not surprising, honestly, because this is a, a, a set of, this was a set of partly manufacturing, partly textile, and other types of garment sector um, enterprises where actually physical safety was not sort of a top concern um, and, uh, or a top priority. Interestingly, though, employers, even though you can't see this, didn't seem to be averse to paying this. In other words, it seemed like employers, you didn't have to bribe them a lot with incentives or you didn't have to offer a lot of fines in order to get them to say, yes, I'll offer accident insurance. So again, this struck us as a potential win-win solution. However, if you turn now to sort of the crux of the issue, which is hours and overtime, they have very different preferences. Um, what we see from basically the large negative signs on employees working long hours without overtime, which is unsurprisingly, employees don't like to work long hours without overtime pay. Not surprising. Employers, on the other hand, have to essentially be bribed substantially with quite a lot of um, loan assistance, marketing assistance, or a really serious threat of high fines. 
in order to actually be willing to let their employees work less or be willing to pay overtime pay that they're legally required to pay. So our key takeaways from this are really as follows. There are definitely a couple of places that look like they're low-hanging fruit. So as you know, development practitioners, if we want to think about what are the places it might be the easiest to focus first, um, it seemed that termination notice and accident insurance were potential quick, easy wins. Um, and in particular, to perhaps get over whatever coordination problems there might be, um, one way to overcome this might be to collaborate between, say, the employee unions that are there, and there are employer trade unions as well, and perhaps have some sort of a dual-sided enforcement mechanism, where if there's an employer and an employee, and they both offer to give notice, that those trade unions would sort of be there to facilitate that and ensure that it was enforced. Um, the other takeaway, as I said, is simply that, you know, it, it seemed that to really get basic conditions like overtime pay and hours enforced, there was going to have to either be substantially more enforcement capacity than the Bangladeshi Labor Committee has right now. Um, and in fact, when enforcement really is a challenge, um, it seemed that perhaps incentives might be a more practical way to go, at least in the short run. There are, for example, um, SME associations in Bangladesh that offer different types of loans, and that might be a slightly um, less challenging way to address some of these um, issues in the short run. I'll stop there, and thank you. I now call uh, uh, Francesca Tarey for on domestic workers in Argentina. You know, domestic workers is often uh, a forgotten uh, category of uh, informal uh, employment because they are not working for enterprises and uh, they are not self-employed. They are uh, another category. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, okay, let me see if I find this. Oops. Wait. <laughs> wow. <laughs> with the safe option. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Okay, so the out <laughs> no, come, on, come on. Okay. Please bear with me a second. <laughs> I'll start here. No problem. Um, this first slide intends to show the importance of um, domestic work and its weight in Latin America as a whole. Something is... <laughs> I need help. Sorry. Let's start from the beginning. Oh, thank you. And then, but how do I? Yes. Can you please ask the assistant of Barbara? <laughs> Alive. Yeah, it is alive and we cannot <laughs> stop it. <laughs> I think this is okay, I can. 
Okay, very sorry about that. <laughs> now I'm, I'm really going to start. So this presentation is about uh, informality among domestic workers in Argentina and recent policies applied to improve the working situation. So the, out the outline of the presentation um, goes as follows. I'm going to talk about the weight of domestic workers on employment and informality in Argentina and also in Latin America. <laughs> then I will move, move on to present them some recent <laughs> policies aimed at improving this worker situation. I'm going to be talking about regulatory changes, formalization policies, and social dialogue in this sector. Then I will move to examine some positive impacts but also based on a qualitative approach, I'm going to be talking about some resistances from employers to continue the formalization process. And I will close with some reflections on the experience in terms of opportunities and challenges ahead for public policies. So, okay. Um, I think you may all know that together with Asia, um, Latin America is one of the regions where domestic workers have um, an important weight. Um, uh, they represent nearly 7% of total workers. If you see the numbers, Argentina is very similar to Latin America as a whole. Um, domestic workers represent nearly 15% of all female workers, and nearly two-thirds of this workforce um, develops this activity in informality. This is without social contributions from their employers. And they account for nearly 10% of all informal work in the region and in the country in particular. So I move now to um, the um, recent policies applied to this sector in Argentina. One first important thing is that until 2013, the legislation that um, covered these workers was very discriminatory. Uh, for example, they didn't have um, maternity leave. They only those who worked at least 16 weekly hours were included in the regulation, so that left almost 40% of all domestic workers outside any legislation. So in the last 15 years, the Argentinian government started to take some measures to improve this situation, and this started in 2005 um, with some formalization policies in the form of tax incentives for households who registered their workers. Uh, this meant that households who pay income tax are allowed to deduct up to a certain extent salaries and social protection contributions for domestic workers. And this was accompanied by a strong awareness raising campaign, and it had some results. And then in 2013, a new law for domestic workers was passed, replacing the old and discriminatory law. And this time, all workers were covered independently of their working hours. New basic rights were granted, such as paid maternity leave, occupational risk insurance, and the right of collect for collective bargaining for this sector. I'm, I'm going to talk about this in a second. And lastly, um, existing rights were scaled up to uh, equalize this, this situation with uh, the rest of private salaried workers. This meant the reduction of the working days from 12 hours to 8 hours, the extension of uh, sick leave, paid holidays, and the increase of severance pay. Again, this was accompanied by a new awareness campaign and the announcements of controls and sanctions. So if we see this graph, here we can see the results. Okay, we went from 5% of registered domestic workers in the year, in the very beginning of the century, to a current 26%, which seems very modest, it is mo a modest advance, but it's very significant in relative terms because Indicators of informality are really moved slowly. 
And if we see the moments when informality increases more significantly, these moments coincide with the policies applied. We have 2005 with the tax incentives for households and the awareness campaign, and we have 2013 when the new, with the new law, the awareness campaign and the announcements of controls and sanctions. So, um, so we've seen regulatory changes, formalization policies, and in 2005, Argentina became the second country in the region after Uruguay in setting up an instance of tripartite social dialogue for domestic workers. Previously, wages were determined unilaterally by the government. So up to 2018, up to last year, domestic workers have engaged in four tripartite social dialogues, and the agreements have been focused on uh, the level of wages because we live in a high inflationary economy. Uh, but this dialogue also provided a platform to debate around other labor demands, such as um, issues of security and hygiene within households, the demand that uh, employers should travel, that uh, should pay the cost travels to and from work, among others. So how is the table of negotiation composed? It's composed by three parties. The first is our pre-existing domestic workers' unions, the second, organizations of employers, of course, and the third, the government. So probably when we think about setting up table of tables of negotiation for this kind of workers, the main challenge, uh, I don't have the animation anymore, but I wanted to highlight uh, uh, organizations' employers, because they don't previously exist and they have to be created ad hoc. So in this sense, Argentina followed the example of Uruguay, which acted as a leading case, and invited a civil organization of housewives, which originally aimed to defend the value of non-remunerated domestic work. So this worked quite well, and this organization is receiving training and resources to promote formalization. And the second challenge had, has to do with the presence of the government in this negotiating table. Um, the government wanted to sit in the table and to have a vote because it feared that concessions might be too high and this could threaten not only the levels of employment in the sector, but also the levels of formalization. So um, the challenge would be to um, strengthen the dynamic of negotiation between employers and employees in order to the government to reduce its participation or eventually withdraw. And finally, among domestic workers, there were disputes among the domestic workers' unions over uh, which one had the right or the legit legitimacy to represent workers. Uh, and the policy of the government was to include them all in the table. But if we move to a scheme of classical collective bargaining, um, the more representatives will have to prevail, so that's a potential future challenge. Um, I forgot to say that the fact that the government sat, sits on the table uh, prevents us from talking about authentic collective bargaining, because collective bargaining, by definition, is bilateral between employers and employees. So we need to reduce government participation. So if we see <laughs> um, this figure, um, here we can um, appreciate the evolution of the national minimum wage, which applies for all uh, private salaried workers, and domestic workers' minimum wage. Before social dialogue began, many times uh, domestic workers' minimum wage was slightly below the national minimum wage, which is not only important in symbolic terms, because it signals that this occupation is not the same as others, but also it's important in economic terms because these salaries are very low and any different counts for workers. So after social dialogue, these two wages have been um, moving very closely and we could interpret that social dialogue has worked in order to ensure a parity here with the national minimum wage. Um, and now I'm going to talk about some impacts from a qualitative point of view based on a set of focus groups with employers and employees. And one thing that we observe is that the topic of formalization and the new rights granted by law are firmly installed among employers and employees. And among workers and among many employers themselves, even though informality still prevails, the new law, registrations, and salaries, salaries negotiated to social dialogue, have become a parameter to evaluate, evaluate their labor conditions. And one thing that uh, generated a main question for the research was the fact that employers tended to assert that 
registration was convenient for them because employers' contributions are inexpensive, in fact, they are subsidized, and that registration protects employers, for example, in front of um, a work-related accident and a potential legal demand. So the question that came up was why is it that most of them still do not register their employees? 75% of them don't do it. So here I present some of the things that employers do not say, but which can be read as the advantages of having an informal worker. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to salaries, uh, uh, as one might expect, informal workers perceive uh, on average 25% less than formal workers. Many times they do not receive formal pay rises and they do not dare to ask for them. And the fear of dismissal is very installed in their discourse. They always uh, prefer that there are uh, 10 people waiting to occupy their job post. Um, <coughs> when it comes, um, there is another uh, important benefit for uh, formal workers in Argentina, which is the annual bonus, which is one extra salary per year, half paid in June and half paid in December. So employers tend not to pay it or to pay it partially when the worker is informal. And when they pay it partially, they do so in December. And many times this is uh, a little gift or a small sum of extra cash, and it's uh, completely blended with the idea of a Christmas present, uh, rather than an obligation, labor-related obligation. When it comes to pay holidays, employers uh, tend to say they do, they do give holidays to their workers, but they, not, they do not pay for it. And um, those who hire by the hour tend not to pay holidays at all. And those who hire full-time workers sometimes uh, pay holidays, but ask the worker to come to water the plants or to feed pets. And that means long trips from the outskirts of the city to the capital and so on. Uh, in terms of job stability, workers, informal workers, are frequently dismissed, temporarily laid off, or have their hours reduced, always according to employers' needs. And these needs can be um, the need to save money for a big celebration, for a trip, uh, the fact that kids have entered school for the very first time, so the domestic worker is no longer needed so many hours, and so on. So this tells us that this occupation tends to be considered as a consumption like any other, rather than as a labor-related commitment. And this is particularly traumatic, the lack of job stability, because no severance pay um, Domest informal domestic workers do not receive any severance pays. Rather, the end of the labor relationship is marked by the idea of giving or receiving back the key. Um, and uh, workers do know that it's their right to receive severance pay, but they do not ask for it because uh, they need references for a new job. So, promisingly, when there is a formal contract, all basic rights tend to be observed. And that is because registration in Argentina, we can see this in the pay slips, marks the existence of the labor relationship, of course, as well as many of its rights. For example, the pay slip says the working hours, the amount of the salary, the amount of uh, paid leaves, the amount of annual bonuses when they are paid. So according to the um, research, we can state that the cost of registering workers is much higher than just these social security contributions that we talked about at the beginning. Going back to the question of why employers do not formalize is because formalization substantially limits or at least clearly reveals the arbitrary and unequal labor arrangements that employers often subject workers to. So considering this, um, if appealing to um, employer, em employ informing employers and appealing to their goodwill is important, it is not enough. And in this sense, with this I finish, uh, the Argentinian experience suggests that a multidimensional approach is needed. Um, things that have worked well uh, include, of course, information and awareness raising campaigns, the adaptation of regulatory frameworks in order to equalize rights with other workers and to signal that this occupation is one occupation like any other that should be formalized, economic incentives for employers, uh, the fact that contributions have been made very affordable, and these two things, economic incentives for employers and the affordability of contributions, have been criticized as a state subsidy to middle classes. However, uh, those who contested this argument 
uh, have stated that uh, it creates a state revenue whereas it did not previously exist and at the same time contributes to create a culture of formalization that can persist even if subsidies are withdrawn. And of course, this can be read the other way around, the subsidy to the formalization of workers and their access to a future pension. Um, controls and sanctions on non-compliers uh, has been important, but of course, how, um, how labor inspectors cannot enter private households. So this is a tough issue when it comes to domestic work. But in Argentina, there have, there have been some uh, alternatives, some attempts to surmount this obstacle. For example, the National Tax Office has um, set regular inspections in wealthy areas of the city, with stalls in the sidewalks, in front of residential buildings, and in front of private neighborhoods, um, who, which often have a separate entrance for domestic workers. So they intercept the domestic worker and ask it for whom do you work, do you have your registration papers, and if the worker didn't have it, the employers were appointed in front of justice. And another strategy from the National Tax Office was to send letters to the wealthier 10% households uh, who, declare having, who didn't declare having um, a domestic worker, asking to confirm the situation by, by a sworn statement. And there is a huge fine if this is not true. Of course, the impact of these measures is very limited in terms of what can change immediately, but it, it, uh, they can act as an exemplary measure uh, of what uh, there are consequences when you do not register your worker. And the state is alert, and it matters. So it's more of a symbolic um, complement. And finally, the recent emergence of digital platforms offering these services which appear also in Argentina, can be marking a new opportunity to detect, because the, the difficult thing when it comes to domestic work is to detect the labor relationship, and, and it's perhaps an interesting channel to formalize these um, labor relationships. The main platform in Argentina offers uh, services um, to, for households to find them a, a worker, a permanent worker, so they have been assessed by the government to offer them to register the worker, e and even if households do not accept these uh, service offers, they receive emails and leaflets ex explaining why this is important um, and how to proceed if they want to do so, and so on. And finally, sometimes, of course, these platforms send, uh, send um, occasional workers to households, and there we have, of course, the debate of whether or not this is independent work for domestic workers, but at least, uh, this prompts a debate, and uh, the relationship is detected, we know it's there, and as a result of the debate, decisions should come up uh, in order to continue regulating this occupation. Well, thank you very much. Sorry for the <laughs> technical. Okay, let me call now Benjamin Lambery for his presentation on uh, Cambodia. Yes. Uh, I remind you that uh, Benjamin uh, was not uh, scheduled for this session, so his presentation is not uh, properly in the focus of the session, but uh, he will do his best. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I will try. Pressure, pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So, yeah, my name is Benjamin Landré. Quickly, I'm just a social researcher in Cambodia for the company called Encore Research. Yeah, indeed, it's not so much in the topic of this session because we were, uh, I was asked to, to write about decent work intervention in the Cambodian government sector. This is like typically the most formal sector in Cambodia. So, it's not so much in the informal sector. But, well, maybe you can turn it in this way. You can see what it can become when it is formalized. <laughs> so um, I'll structure my presentation. It has a lot of similarities with what uh, with the, the, the previous one. In fact, I will start by just giving some context numbers and then uh, mention the issues, the main, the burning issues in Cambodia in the government sector, and uh, and finally some uh, interesting initiatives that tackle these issues and that show that yeah, you, government when they, oh, I mean government yeah, states can do something can. 
uh, when it is formalized, when the sector is formalized, it brings a lot of uh, social benefits to the, to the workers. So, um, yeah, very quickly, the common sector, garment industry in Cambodia, that's more than 640,000 workers in more than 660 factories, that's in 2017. Um, that's basically 5% of the population. Some reports say that there are actually some uh, non-registered factories in Cambodia. So there is a little bit of informal sector even in, in the garment industry. And these numbers could, be, could uh, reach 1 million workers in almost 1,000 factories. So we have a little bit of informal sector, but we don't know about them. Uh, it's mostly low added value processes, so cut, make, trim. Uh, Cambodia doesn't do anything about designing the clothes, about uh, uh, the machinery, about uh, uh, producing the fabric. They just import everything and cut, make, trim. Uh, this is the most important uh, export component of, uh, uh, for the country, uh, representing 72% of the total merchandise export in 2017. And, and it is worth like more than $8 billion. Uh, again, in, in that same year, in 2017, it's constantly increasing. For example, in 2012, it was a bit more than $4 billion. The main clients are the European Union and the US. It, it's may be bound to change because I will talk at the end of the everything but arm deal that is being revised now by, uh, by the European Union. So it might become a bit more difficult for Cambodia uh, to export to European Union in the future. Uh, describing the, um, the workforce, it's a very young workforce. It's 25 years old on average, mostly female. 80% uh, of the workers are, are female workers and uh, more than 90% of the factories are foreign owned. That helps explaining why it is so formalized because most, almost 100% of the foreign owned businesses in Cambodia are registered because you are under the spotlight in Cambodia. Uh, like authorities would come and check you in priority. Um, very quickly, because it's boring, the legal and institutional context on the, on the garment sector, so the labor law in 97 basically set the, the, the distinction between employer employees, the right, the obligation of both parties, how to set up a, a, an enterprise or set, establish an enterprise, what um, contract must be, some basic rules on uh, freedom of association, some ba basic rules on the uh, right to strike, these kind of things. Uh, it's being revised now, amended now, um, to replace the dismissal indemnity, so that an indemnity that the employer had to give to uh, the employee if he fires him or her. Uh, it's being replaced now by a seniority indemnity uh, from now on. I mean, it's not clear yet. They're still working on that on Praka. Praka in Cambodian, it means sub-decree. Uh, after a year of work, you are entitled to, to get some, uh, some seniority. So that's good. That gives a little bit more uh, security. Then there's a law on social security and the Praka number 109, both of them worked in a way to create the national uh, national social security fund. So that's the equivalent for, for France as La Sécu, uh, Sécurité Sociale, the social security. Um, I'll come back to it a bit later. Finally, the very controversial law on trade union in 2016, plus the three sub-decrees that, uh, that followed in 2018. Controversial because it is seen by the government as a way to improve uh, dispute settling yeah, that's what we say in English, dispute settling. But it's seen by the employees, by the unions, that as a, uh, a restriction on the freedom of association, on the right to strike. And I'll again come back about it in a, in a later slide. The law minimum wage, it's still a draft at this stage, but the Cambodia is now very interestingly trying to set a minimum wage for everybody under the labor law. Uh, well, everybody except domestic workers. They're not even they're not even recognized our workers after the labor, labor law not yet so we need to to learn from Argentina. Um, the Praca number four eighty is linked also to the National so Social Security Fund. It just recently increased the contribution to uh, from the employers from one point six to three point four. So it almost doubled the contribution last year. So it's really good. Everybody sees it as a, a good point except the employers um, and. Um, Institution, the institution in uh, in the sector. So MOLVT is the Ministry of Labor and Vocational Training. Obviously, that the, the government part, GMAC. This is the Union for Factories. So the um, Garment Manufacturer Association of Cambodia, ILO BFC, has been very very big stakeholders. Uh, stakeholder BFC is a Better Factory Cambodia. I will come back to this program. This is 
probably among the, 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 the biggest in, uh, initiative in Cambodia. Union Worker Arbitration Council. I forgot somebody important here. I forgot the brands. They are very important too. Uh, and there they are some federation of brands also. And I forgot to add them here, I'm sorry. Um, so now that we have the context, let's move on to try to understand the issues in Cambodia, in the, in the garment industry. And I will just show you this graph that is taken from the annual report from ILOBFC last year that shows the strike activity reported by the GMAC members. So GMAC, it almost gathers every factor in Cambodia, almost all 660 of them. And uh, for the orange line, that the lost work days. So that's a similar pattern. You see that it's a general decrease since 2013, and a very sharp one, actually, from 2015 to 2016. And so to try to explain that, the most, let's say, optimistic reports would say, yeah, now, we have minimum wage that is increasing. We, uh, it's easier to uh, settle disputes. There's more negotiation between the workers, the union, and the employers. Uh, the general working conditions are better in the factory, thanks to ILO, thanks to uh, uh, a lot of development partners, including AFD, for that matter. Um, but the most optimistic and cynical people, including me, uh, say it's because of the trained union law that passed in 2016. And as I said, it restricts the right to strike from workers, it restrict uh, the 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 make it more difficult. Sorry, for union to be registered, it actually uh, uh, introduce a concept of uh, most representative status union. It means that in a factory, you workers to uh, every two years would be asked would be asked to vote for the union they think represent them the most, and only this union has the right to represent them and defend them. So imagine a, a factory in Cambodia that is uh, around, on average, 1,000 workers and has five or six unions. Most of them, most of the time, have a very equal share. So if you have, like, uh, like I don't know, five unions in a factory of 1,000 workers and one of the unions take 21%, well, this is the only union that has the right to bargain for anything and it represents only 21% of the workers. So, um, the, yes, obviously, the C70, the, this other part of the 79% of the workers, if they have anything they want to complain about, if they want to strike, they cannot, as per the law. So that explains why we have a, a huge drop here, I mean, I believe. Um, so let's tackle these issues one by one, as I just mentioned now. The burning topic now is freedom of association in Cambodia. This tr law on trade union took a long time to pass. There's been strikes. It's been difficult, but the government pushed on it. Uh, only the most representative statute union can negotiate with the employers, bargain agreement, and represent, be representative representative pardon, at the um, arbitration council. The arbitration council is like uh, our government body that, uh, is, that is tripartite, that represent the workers, the union, and, uh, sorry, the workers, the employers, and the government. Uh, and it was seen before that as very, very good, excellent at setting, settling disputes. But because of this law, and because unions are restricted in, uh, in representing the workers at the Arbitration Council, it has become a bit less relevant. Minority unions, as per the law, are prohibited from demanding, well, anything. Uh, they, th if you're part of a minority union, you, that's all. The, uh, the only hope you have is to go uh, to the court, but on individual dispute, you, it, it, will the, it will be the normal uh, justice system, right? the normal court system. And so nobody follows on that because the workers don't have enough money to, to sustain a, a court on their own, a trial on their own. Um, last year, 2018, there's been this sub decree number 303 on the most representative status. So the government saw that it was very controversial, uh, the, the law on trade union, and tried to make the registration of union a bit better, a bit easier to understand with less bureaucracy, less demand. But it didn't change anything on the rights and obligation of the most representative status and the minority unions. So it's still just as bad. <laughs> uh, the impact of this law actually is well described in a, in a BFC report, in a low BFC report, it noted several negative change. So actually, don't see my, my comments. I can't remember all of them by heart. But it was, for example, the, um, the compliance of factories on 
the control of unions. Normally, the unions need to be independent, not be controlled by the factories, right? Well, since this law passed, there's been a regression on the level of compliance of factories to this standard. It means there's more employers now, I don't know who, if I may say, infiltrate their most representative status union to, well, make them say what they want them to say. That's an example. Um, also, some intimidation of workers. This kind of indicator, sorry, I, 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 I can't remember all of them, but there's been some negative change on, uh, on that. The next issue is a minimum wage. So in 2013, 2014, there's been huge demonstration in Cambodia that was in the same time as a commune election that were very important too. Uh, and this demonstration ended up, ended up dramatically with five people being killed uh, and it all stemmed as a minimum wage negotiation. In 2013, the level of income was of $80 per, per month. Uh, in 2012, it was a 60, for example, and it has kept increasing since then. Uh, the problem with the minimum wage in Cambodia is that increasing the minimum wage is a political tool. That's to say, when you have an election to come, the government would almost arbitrarily say, OK, let's put up the wage, and then we, we, we can you know, make people happy and vote for us again. And um, uh, employers and brands have difficulty to follow up that. That's a, a very big issue on planification uh, because they don't know what to expect. They don't know when the government will, will have their next uh, minimum wage increase. Um, it looks better, right, for workers. Like the monthly take-home pay uh, is now of uh, $240 plus. In Cambodia, that's a decent living for on average, I think in uh, in urban areas, it's a bit more than $150 on average. In rural areas, it's much lower. So let's say $240, $240 is not too bad. But what we don't see is that before 2013, there was actually a decrease in the minimum wage. So this increase since 2016 is actually seen as a readjustment. And there's been a lot of inflation too in the country. And so people say that this minimum increase, minimum wage increase doesn't cover for the inflation. The purchasing power st still remains low among the factory workers. And um, they, how to say, the work in a, in a factory in Cambodia, it's temporary most of the time. You have a project, you want to finance a big project or you want to help your family. It's been the ILO report show, for example, that um, a garment factory worker send money to an estimated three or four people. Uh, they count on overtime to complete their salary. And it's not because the minimum wage increase that they go, they, they, they work less overtime. On the very contrary, it's been uh, shown in the last few reports that uh, they work more overtime. They're more likely to work, uh, to work overtime, even with higher minimum wage. And this brings me to the next topic, sorry, overtime. As per the Cambodian law, that's eight hours per day, six days a week, plus max two hours per day of volunteer overtime, voluntary overtime, sorry. Uh, the issue is not so much with factory forcing the employees to, to stay and work more than two hours. It's only 1.3% of forced labor, according to the last ILO report. It's more about workers who just voluntarily say, we stay more than two hours per day because it's a, it's a peak production production day. I will make more money on overtime. Uh, and actually, the, the sector kind of blame on brands and buyers people because they, uh, on the last minute orders, for example, you know, like you arrive in a, in a period of the year and, uh, and uh, a given brand would say, oh, we need 20,000 t-shirts right now. And so the factory has no choice but, yeah, to ask who wants to work more than two hours of the time a day. So there's a little bit of effort that's needed here from the, the, the buyers also. The next uh, issue is child labor. Um, in Cambodia, as per the law, the working age, the legal working age is 15. But until 18, you, they don't have the right to, uh, to do overtime and it's much, uh, the, the regulation is much stricter than uh, when you are above age, above 18, sorry. Um, and the issue now is almost 100% solved. Uh, the BFC program 
to child labor as the very first one of the very first topic to 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 tackle i think in cambodia and did a good job for that you see the numbers in the table uh, and most of the cases now it's not factories hiring like uh, knowingly fa hiring underage kids uh, people it's uh, workers coming f with falsified document make the factory believe they are 18 and in fact they they less um, the highest rates of non-compliance again as per the ILO BFC report they're mostly on uh, on general working condition like adequate lighting adequate ventilation uh, temperature uh, and adequate equipment and staff in, the, in a garment factory infirmary etc <coughs> There's um, these topics um, tackled in the in the sorry in the labor law somehow and in some policies on the OHS uh, occupational health and safety, but there's a lot of non-compliance. I don't know why. I'm not sure why. There's not a lot of pressure from uh, from development partners on this, and um, and in Cambodia we have. A, regularly some mass fainting events you know you open the newspaper every two weeks and you see like 400 workers who faint in a factory and when you read a little bit better uh, yeah there was a chemical burning and the ventilation was not enough and just people fainted uh, so yeah it's not tackled enough but that's a subjective uh, um, uh, feeling here other non-compliance issues are discrimination on gender uh, with for example female workers well, I told you it's 80% of the workforce, but they're more likely to be hired on, uh, on basic skills, whereas uh, at the same level of education, sorry, whereas male would be hired, more likely to be hired on, uh, on supervision skills, management uh, tasks, sorry. There's a discrimination on pregnancy status with, for example, uh, ladies who get pregnant who don't get rehired or who don't see their contract reconducted, uh, extended. Uh, I told you already there's a lot of dic discrimination on union membership also. And one of the, the big topics now also is a fixed duration contract. The law is not so clear on, on in Cambodia on a fixed duration contract. Some people understand it as you can only be on fixed duration contract for two years. And the factories understand it as the fixed duration contract. You can have as many as you want as long as it's no more than two years. So there's a big difference in any uh, understanding, right? And, uh, and carefully, nobody really uh, uh, tackled the issue yet, but it's going to happen. A lot of people now complain. The strikes and the arbitration council dispute are more and more often on these FDCs. Um, and 70% of the factory uh, do not comply. Because So when I say do not comply, BFC has decided that the... the understand the definition as a two-year limit, whatever or whatever the number of fixed-term contract you may have. And so on If uh, on this definition, you would have 70% of factory non-complying. Um, that this is a strong, uh, how to say, impact, because uh, the, the workers on AFDC, uh, they don't have the same indemnity, the same uh, incentives as uh, uh, undetermined duration workers. So they, they miss uh, an, uh, an extra day of annual leave after three years of service. They don't have the same bonuses, indemnities. Uh, I talked of seniority payment. Imagine if you have only uh, uh, like eight months, nine months fixed duration contract, you're not entitled to this seniority payment. So there's a lot of implication there. Uh, and finally, transportation. So I just put a, yeah, a picture. And, yeah. Uh, one of the other big big topic in Cambodia every time you have an accident I'll let you imagine the, how dramatic it can be and nobody want to to deal on its topic because it's very sensitive uh, the, the, the employee the employees say it should be the employers the employers say it should be the brands and the brands say we need the government to put regulation so it's just to say how complicated the, the issue is uh, some now I will Maybe just list a few initiatives or mechanisms that are dealing with uh, the issues I just mentioned. So the National Social Security Fund, I uh, mentioned it briefly before. Uh, it's been set by the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Finance, Economy and Finance. It actually existed in uh, 1955, but then the Khmer Rouge got rid of it in the 70s. It was reinstated by law uh, by the law on social security in 2007 and later on by PRACA in 2007, uh, 
2002 and 2007, sorry. It applies to all enterprises with more than seven employees. And as per the last PRACA, the last sub-decree, uh, employers have to contribute uh, at 7.4 percent rate, like seven percent of the employer employee salary goes into the NSSF. Uh, it covers employment injury and disease scheme, uh, health insurance scheme. Should it be at work or not at work? Oh my God! <coughs> and the pension scheme. <laughs> uh, it's calculated on a, on a percentage of daily average rate. Um, the arbitration council, as I said, is a tripartite uh, entity that uh, that settles the dispute uh, between. So it's made of union, employer association, and a ministry. It has had a very good uh, uh, success rate in settling disputes at almost 80% in 2016. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I have to go fast. I've been told I don't have a lot of time left. Uh, the Bechtel Factory Cambodia is definitely the the one of the biggest initiatives there. With this program, the BFC inspectors go to each factory, each member of, uh, of the factory, and run an assessment with several indicators, core labor standards and working conditions. There's a number of indicators, and, uh, and they write reports on a yearly basis. These indicators, this level of compliance, and how to say, convince the buyers to get the production made by uh, this factory or this factory. There's a new uh, initiative that started last year. It's called the Action Collaboration Transformation uh, Act initiative. That's something that goes a bit higher. It, it's a joint initiative of the brands, and it's aimed at uh, uh, help planifying the increase in the living wage, not minimum wage, living wage. And, uh, and uh, again, uh, with the collective bargaining, as mentioned before, uh, in a, in a presentation just before, uh, I will try to go fast. This this system, this act initiative, unfortunately, is limited by uh, the law on trade union because it implies that uh, uh, workers have full freedom of association. Uh, other programs, initiative uh, at a maybe a bit smaller level uh, on general reproductive health, like for example, the, to set a factory infirmary nutrition program in the factories. That's a program we worked on with AFD a few years ago. Awareness raising activity, family planning, OHS initiative, early child care. There's some factories now that uh, are trying to set um, preschool in their premises. Uh, breastfeeding program to allow for the, the, the ladies who just have a newborn to, to take some time off. Personal development with libraries being set, uh, settled in the company, in the factories. And now environmental aspect with social, uh, solid waste management, energy efficiency, uh, use of renewable energies. And very quickly, this is my last slide, sorry. The everything but arms deal. So uh, this deal very basically, allows developing country duty-free access to European Union market for all export goods. So for Cambodia, it's garment goods, right? Garment manufactured goods. Uh, it is, there is one article of the EBA that says if you don't respect uh, human rights uh, and if, you, if it is shown that you, uh, you don't have a real democracy, we may revoke these uh, this, um, advantages. And Cambodia recently, uh, how to say? has had questionable attitude of uh, uh, human rights and freedom and full democracy. And so the European Union is now reviewing, revising their status on the, on the matter. Uh, there's different level of concern among the workers and, and employ employers and the government. The workers and the employers are very afraid that they won't be able to to export as much as they did before because of higher tariff if they if they get um, if Cambodia get dismissed from EBA. But the government says that thanks to the trade war between U.S. and China, a lot of Chinese factories are moving to Cambodia anyway, so uh, they don't care basically uh, if they get uh, dismissed from EBA. Um, I'm sorry, I took a little bit more time than expected, and uh, that's all for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, the speakers can uh, come and uh, sit here, please. So, any questions from the audience? 
so. I can yes. start asking a question. Thank you very much. Three very interesting presentation. And uh, even though it is true that they were, might have not be fully, fully on the same exact topic, I did find a common thread. And I wanted to have maybe a, a bit of words from all the three or even four of you on, uh, on the matter. So uh, what it seemed to me uh, a, a case like among the three country experiences, uh, and particularly it's either sector or, sector or la labor relation, was the fact that whenever there was more information shared in each of these like, uh, specific research that you have done, you did tend to see that there was a better uh, worker condition like uh, the taking into place. And so I wanted to ask you if whether it is possible for you for, or any of you to start by giving us a sense of how much you think that either maybe in the case of uh, Bangladesh, when you were mentioning about the worker employee employer relations, uh, or for the domestic workers' uh, representation and like gains, and as well in Cambodia, uh, what could be uh, a better way to have a representation and information being shared uh, in each specific scenario? And whether do you think that for each of your country experiences, there would be at least one or two potentials to? to basically in of improvement in terms of uh, these work relations. I'll, I'll start, I guess, with the Bangladeshi context. And in particular, I mean, I think I even within Bangladesh, things will be clearly different depending on whether we're talking about large textile factories or whether we're talking about the context that I worked in. So I'll focus on the context where we did our employer-employee surveys. And this was, a number of different small and medium enterprise clusters. So what tends to happen around the urban areas is that sec small businesses that work in a particular sector, whether it's handicrafts or um, sort of a particular kind of manufacturing or, or something like that, tend to gather together in one area for all the usual reasons. All the workers with you know experience in that sector are there and the businesses can sort of set up their supply chains in the same place. Um, and so in that context, what we thought might be the most useful way to encourage this type of information sharing is really through the employers have these trade associations that are there. As far as we could tell, the employees really hadn't collectivized in any way. Um, but certainly you could see within at the local level that there would be some mechanism for having an employee association that would essentially talk with an employer association. And to us, the really important thing seemed to be not even so much about just information, but also developing some sort of enforcement mechanism. So for example, as I mentioned, both parties clearly want to give and get notice, um, but there seems to be a concern that just because it's written into the contract doesn't mean the other party will actually give notice. And if through these trade associations or workers associations, if they can create them, there was some enforcement mechanism of that, I think that would have a shot at solving some of these problems. When, when it comes about information sharing, I think um, before we have managed to establish this social dialogue table, I think uh, domestic workers unions and organizations of employers have become uh, the channels par excellence um, through disseminate uh, all the work that we do. Um, in fact, that's, that has happened. Uh, I have and many colleagues presented the results in front of them. Uh, we share publications. Um, they are really empowered after um, this participation in the negotiating table. And uh, of course, information awareness raising campaign, awareness raising campaigns are also very effective, are expensive, but that's another thing that works very well. And um, I think your last question was, how to uh, continue with the... Um, I'm going to give a particular example about Argentina, f um, because that's the case that I know the most. For example, what really worked best to increase formalization for domestic workers were economic incentives, not surprisingly, for households. These economic incentives were aimed at upper class uh, level households, because th those were, are the ones that pay income tax. But the thing is that in unequal societies like um, it happens in Latin America, uh, also middle um, and lower middle class households hire these services. So we should consider the possibility of thinking about some economic incentives for them as well. 
um, that I think is the key issue because that's the measure that worked most rapidly and more effectively when it comes to raising formality levels. Um, I mean, it's difficult because, again, the government sector in Cambodia, I will talk about Cambodia also because I don't know some context I know the most about. Um, it's the most formalized, so I guess it's more, if, you, if the question is what's next, it's uh, the good thing in Cambodia is that it's a success story. Uh, the government sector in Cambodia, the way it's been formalized, the way it, there are challenges, I presented the challenges to you, but they are being tackled one by one. And uh, what it's doing now, it's showing the example for all other informal sectors domestic workers, it, people talk about it more and more in Cambodia too, it's bound to happen. Uh, uh, the hospitality sector is now looking at the garment sector, what did you do, what can we do uh, to, to follow you on that. Um, information, so in the garment sector for now there's a lot of data, there's not a lot of data in the informal sector in Cambodia, but recently there's been more economic census conducted, there's some really obvious effort from the government, from the development partners to gather data on that. For example, I also mentioned uh, it's been a few years that the working permit, uh, uh, the law on working permit has been implemented. Like the, go the government is trying to, how to say that, to, be, to formalize it, to formalize the sector more, to know more what's happening in the country. Um, and, um, the law on minimum wage also that is being drafted is one of the obvious result of that. Like it worked well with the government sector, there's been some hiccups, okay, but what can we do now to extend it to other sectors? And they try to build it based on a, on a number of social, socioeconomic criteria. It will not come easily. It has to come with uh, 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 involving everybody, the government, the unions, like it has been mentioned several times. Um, it, we also have to take into account that Cambodia was heavily subsidized country. There's millions and millions and millions of dollars coming from development organization. And, until, and they start to leave now because Cambodia two years ago reached the lower middle income country status. And so there's less and less money now. So Cambodia has to transition to a more regulated uh, context, a more formal context. And I think the, con the, the, the example of the garment industry will, will be very useful for other sectors to develop. Yeah. Yes, please. It's yeah, no, it's I would like to comment on the point you raised uh, twice, uh, th the minimum wage. I think it's an important point in our discussion today. Um, in, an, in, a, in an ideal world, maybe we don't need a minimum wage because, you know, decentralized uh, negotiations between firms and workers would do, would do it. But we know that in some countries it's not the case because there is so much disequilibrium that we need this minimum wage. And um, uh, I had the opportunity to work on the implementation of the minimum wage in Malaysia. And one of the examples we used uh, was South Korea. So we invited people from the South Korean Council because they have a council on minimum wage and they do exactly the opposite of what you said, discretionary. So they have a council composed of different uh, people, including uh, university professors, so one of them was with us. And they have several factors, including growth in the sector, including in employment, including, so different, uh, uh, and being based on this. So I think this could be a route of having something quite objective to minimize the, the impact of, uh, of political uh, periods. Uh, and my second point is I think there is a gender issue also in uh, the minimum wage because I've noticed in Tunisia, for example, that the minimum wage is so low that for men in general, th they paid more than the minimum wage. However, for women, it's often the minimum wage. So it's important to have the minimum wage for reducing the, the gender gap. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes. And just a question about um, how do you see the relationship between human capital and informality in the research that you have done? If you saw any differences, if you, s if you I don't know, perhaps have example from I don't know, Bangladesh, Cambodia, when you see that people with different human capital 
have different relationship with the firms, whether the firm also has different approach depending on the skills and human capital of, of the employees, whether you know human capital can really put informality on a different trajectory, let's put it in this way. Just if you have an example from, from your research, I know it could be a question up in the air, but if you have an example to share, it would be interesting. Thank you. I can I can speak to something from our, our Bangladesh work. Um, w really, not so much with respect to employers versus how they treat their employees differently, only because the levels of human capital that we saw in our employer-employee survey were just, they were quite homogeneous. Um, they were quite unskilled. But in our initial survey of 2,000 workers, we covered workers from a whole range of different jobs. And as you might expect, what we found is that workers in more formal jobs tended to have higher human capital. But we also, because we asked for job histories, were able to see which kinds of workers were the ones switching from, say, casual to you know private sector regular jobs versus from private sector jobs to self-employment. And we found an interesting pattern. So as you might expect, um, the workers who tended to sort of fall out of regular private sector employment into more casual work tended to be those with lower levels of education and often younger ones. But the ones who tended to leave a, what you might think of as a formal job to go start their own businesses to be self-employed were often older and more educated and often when they left to start those jobs, in fact, experienced an increase in income. So to some extent, I think that speaks very much to the heterogeneity of the informal sector and that it seemed like in many cases that type of self-employment was very much a choice um, versus in other cases you could actually see people taking a, a wage cut and very poor unskilled people moving into work they might not have wanted to do. Well, when it comes to domestic workers, uh, really the levels of education are, are low. 80% uh, of them have secondary incomplete. Uh, if you think at those who complete the secondary level, uh, you will find slightly higher levels of formalization and that has to do with the fact that they are more empowered and they ask for, for these benefits. Um, often they belong to the union, sometimes uh, these things happen. But I would, say, I would say the effect is marginal because this is a structural problem because uh, um, this massive occupation, there is a lot of people waiting and there are low entry barriers, there are lots of women press pressing the labor conditions down because they are ready to to occupy any anyone who is fired while there is another worker uh, waiting to to enter into this labor relation into this labor force so i would say that it has slight uh, effect but the the problem is structural it has to do with the, the inequality and wider things Um, for Cambodia, for the government sector, it's exactly what you just mentioned in Bangladesh, which is weird because against you, you, you that's about the uh, informal sector, and I'm talking about the, the formal sector. We did an attrition survey to try to understand the push factor and the pull factor, and it's exactly what you just mentioned. People who leave uh, the lower, le lower level of education are younger, uh, and uh, people who stay have maybe a higher level of education or a bit older. The in Cambodia, as I mentioned, also the government sector is the salaries are higher than the, than in other sectors, and um, they often stay to save money or to send money back home until a project is fully paid for, and then they move on. They move on, and bon, sometimes they go to uh, the informal sector, so to set up a business. Indeed, sometimes they even go back to school. Uh, so it's it's uh, a weird pat a pattern. Um, Cambodia has tried to make some effort, the government recently, they opened three schools on garment industry, like, like fully specialized on the, on the garment sector, and for workers, and for the management, and that's interesting also maybe to, um, to improve the human capital yeah, on the, on in that area. I don't know if that answers the question. But any comment on the minimum wage? I agree. There's been a lot of pressure in, on the minimum wage in Cambodia. It has put a lot of people in the street. And when I say the government conveniently increased the wage before election, it's uh, obviously more complicated than this, right? But 
but employers and, and brands see it as a, a last moment move most of the time. It, it, there is actually a committee, a tripartite committee that, that negotiate on the wage, etc. And hopefully with uh, the ACT initiative that I very briefly described, it will become more structured. But um, as long as inflation keeps going up, like basically every time they increase the salary, landlords increase their rent. And as long as there's no regulation on that too, or, or some stronger uh, means of calculation, it will be useless to increase the minimum wage. The, 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 the purchase power of the workers is still the same. Any other questions? No? So if not, I will have uh, one for each of the speakers. I uh, will start with the last one. Uh, about Cambodia, uh, it's difficult for me to admit that uh, all the garment sector is uh, formal. Uh, I, I guess that uh, you have been presenting uh, the formal sector of firms, but don't these firms employ some informal employees? Yes, they do. Uh, okay. I that, that was the end of the question? No? Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, sorry. So I, there are more factories than the, than the 600 I mentioned, and they are not registered. The, the ones that are registered, they most of the time registered at GMAC also. They are defended by GMAC Association and at the ILO BFC. They have to comply to a set of rules, <coughs> indicators. They have to pay taxes on exportation, etc. And there are the other factories, the ones that don't care, that don't need to... to um, comply to the rules, they, it may be for the uh, internal market also, maybe they don't aim at exporting, it's for the national market, the working conditions there are usually terrible, and there are also, you are right, there are some, uh, some registered factory that subcontract unregistered factories. This is very, um, I've not seen a lot of reports, there, there must be some reports on that, but I've not seen a lot of this uh, this informal sector and informal garment sector is a little bit of um, um, yeah uh, unknown in, in Cambodia for now or known to me at least but yes it does exist you're right thank you about the domestic workers I would like to know whether in Argentina there was an impact uh, on uh, the registration of domestic workers of the uh, adoption of the ILO conventions on domestic workers. And uh, I, I didn't see uh, the date on your uh, statistics, so. <laughs> yes, you're very right. Uh, that has played uh, an important role as well. The, the thing is, the fourth started in 2005, and the ILO convention um, was in 2011, but of course that was uh, a strong international um, guide and Argentina ratified the, um, the convention after passing the new law in 2014. And after ratifying the convention, it also increased it, its efforts in terms of formalization. Uh, so yes, it was uh, an international um, thing that uh, pushed the country in more deeper into that direction, as well as it did with other countries in the region, because that uh, um, the countries that have ratified the convention are mainly Latin American, so it meant uh, an important uh, help for for our efforts in our efforts in terms of formalizing domestic workers. Thank you. And about your presentation, you presented the uh, informal employment as a continuum uh, by ordering uh, various uh, uh, benefits or social or labor uh, uh, benefits. And uh, uh, when uh, you came to your uh, study, uh, you retained only uh, two of them. Uh, does it mean that uh, uh, the employees and the employers didn't mention the others? And uh, did the order of these uh, benefits uh, was uh, uh, really the order you meant? Gr great question. So the order was supposed to be more um, 
uh, uh, just an idea, right? So I think of safe working conditions as certainly being sort of the most basic thing you can think of, you know, good hygiene and things like that. Um, and certainly a pension seemed to be the rarest of benefits. Basically only government workers got them. But in the middle, I think you could certainly argue there's room for reordering. And I think when you put self-employment in there, it adds a whole different dimension, which is that we often found self-employed workers who seemed better off in terms of wages and education and just working conditions than employed workers, but didn't necessarily get some of those benefits. So it was just meant to give a general idea, certainly not make a case that there is a specific ordering of you know getting better. Um, in terms of which benefits we focused on in the study, um, so good question. We, we number one, um, focused on ones that were at least relatively more common in the Bangladeshi context. Um, and then also we used a number of focus groups to try to first settle in on what workers really found most valuable qualitatively and then focus in on those only because in the choice experiment we couldn't give too many different um, conditions. It would have been too, too much sort of mental burden for people to deal with. But we'd love to go back and try other ones and see what other conditions people are interested in. Thank you. So if there is uh, no more question, we can uh, end the session. Thank you very much. Thank you.